A very, very, very warm welcome to you for this evening session on quality use of research evidence in schools after COVID-19. My name is Lucas Walsh and tonight's session arises from a very fine partnership between the Monash University Faculty of Education and the Paul Ramsey Foundation. And my colleague Mark Rickinson is going to talk a little bit more about that Q project in a moment. But before I introduce our wonderful speakers tonight, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'm currently seated in the land of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd also like to welcome our international audience. Now, I've just had note here of uh, participants from all over the world, Brunei, Indonesia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Fiji, Samoa, the Philippines, China, Timor-Leste, the UK, Northern Ireland, Brazil, and very warm welcome also to our listeners from just about every state and territory in Australia. To all of you, there will be time for questions at the end, and we'll be posting some links to further materials during the presentation. But if a question emerges along the way, please feel free to post it in the chat, and we'll hopefully get time to speak to it at the very end. So, we're living in a time in which the nature and use of evidence is contested. Nowhere is this more pronounced than in relation to the government and community responses to COVID-19. And yet it's also a time when we have seen the return of the expert in public policy decision making. Accessing and using evidence is a skill and is key to the work of skilled professionals such as teachers. And this is the kind of the locus of the burning issue that we're going to explore tonight in relation to schooling. What is also significant to me is that while trust in many public institutions has waned in recent years, public trust in teachers continues to be strong. And the Monash University Faculty of Education produced a wonderful piece of research earlier this year, speaking to just that. Trust in our, presenter, in our teachers continues to be very, very strong. Teaching requires deep expertise, but expectations of teachers are high, as we will explore today. But as we'll also find out, we are building from a strong base, as we shall hear from our presenters. These aren't the first steps that we're talking about. We'll also understand that evidence doesn't exist in a vacuum. Thoughtful engagement with an implementation of appropriate evidence needs to be supported by a combination of individual and organisational enabling components within a complex system. Indeed, evidence use permeates decision-making throughout the education ecosystem. A question for us is, how can we make evidence-informed practice the norm across the teaching uh, work of our schools and decision-making processes in general? We're very, very fortunate tonight to have four very, very good speakers. Firstly, we have Dr. Jenny Donovan, uh, who is the inaugural director of the National Evidence Institute, a very exciting initiative and I think a groundbreaker. Our next speaker will be Associate Professor Mark Rickinson, who is the lead on the Q project. He'll be talking a little bit more about the team's thinking to date, of which I am a member. We're also very, very lucky to have Nigel Holloway, principal of Hamlin Banks Primary School who has a deep passion for this, and I think it will come out in his presentation. And the always erudite Shani Prendergast, senior analyst uh, with Catholic Education Melbourne, who is also extremely articulate talking about matters of evidence use and why they're important. But enough from me, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jenny Donovan, who will set the scene from, let's just say, a systems perspective. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, and I'll just add that I'm joining you this evening from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present. Thank you very much for the invitation to join the discussion this evening. This is, this is kind of my first outing as the director of the National Evidence Institute. So I am inordinately excited to be talking to you about some of the things that I've been thinking about in relation to the importance of evidence and its use in schools. And I, I need to warn you, I've gone a bit general in my comments, but you can rest assured that other speakers are gonna get very specific as we go along. So if you're left wondering, 
Yes, but what does all that mean in practice? Never fear, it will be answered. I also have to confess that I haven't addressed very specifically the implications of COVID, except in as much as we will have a National Evidence Institute post-COVID, which we didn't have before. So I guess there's something. So let's crack on. Slide one, I think, Phoebe, you're doing for me. Thank you. In education, like in health and other sectors, our professional choices can impact the lives of thousands. Teachers make dozens of decisions every day. Some can be planned, many are spontaneous. We're all striving to make the best choices, whether they're big or small, for our students. So what do we draw on when we make those decisions? This will depend on context. We're human. In the moment, we draw on knowledge, experience, learned behaviours, habit. When there's more time for planning or reflection, we might be able to pause and consider. Maybe we think that approach that I've been taking hasn't delivered the outcomes I'd hoped, but what do we do then? The notion that we should be evidence-based or at least evidence-informed is now firmly entrenched in the education lexicon, but I'm not sure it's an expectation that is understood or applied or supported as well as it might be. Next slide, please, Phoebe. I want to reflect for a moment on the job that teaching has become. Teaching's not work that is transactional or predictable or able to be automated. It requires humans to interact, to engage, to observe and make multiple ongoing decisions all day, every day. But to do this work, we give teachers tools that don't assist as much as they could. And by we, I mean those of us who are involved in the decision making and the policy setting level in the education architecture of Australia. There isn't sufficient direction and the elements don't align coherently. The curriculum's considered to be simultaneously overcrowded and yet missing in detail. Detail that might, for example, help teachers identify the most effective teaching approaches. Many assessments that we offer don't clearly relate to the curriculum and the reporting that we provide focuses much more on achievement trends than on insights into student learning of curriculum. We have professional teaching standards, but they're often expressed at such a high level that they can imply impossible expectations rather than helpfully define what we want teachers to do. For example, they expect a teacher to differentiate teaching to meet the specific learning needs of students across the full range of abilities. But this suggests teachers might be expected to prepare and deliver 30 different lessons simultaneously, every lesson to be considered proficient. Our national education infrastructure is in many respects admirable and comparatively robust, but we haven't yet aligned it sufficiently or landed the right level of detail so that teachers have a clear understanding of what they should do and the best ways to do it. The result of being somewhat unconnected and lacking in explicit direction about how to use the tools that we give teachers to work with is that we require them to do a lot of it for themselves. Next slide, please. We're expecting teachers to be all sorts of things that they've not been trained to be. And unsurprisingly, they look for help. They've been somewhat deterred, I reckon, from using textbooks and the curriculum support that used to come from traditional sources isn't meeting their needs any longer. So teachers resort to Google, to Pinterest, looking for content and approaches that will engage the students and offer variety. They put in a lot of time trying to find the content and materials they think will have the greatest effect. And then they have to put in more time trying to align the content or the assessments to the curriculum requirements or the achievement standards. Next slide, please. I think that a lot of the burden that teachers report is the burden of too much choice and a lack of confidence in the choices that they make. And I think that this is true for school leaders as well. Principals might make decisions about purchasing expensive commercial assessments, or they might contract consultants to provide expensive professional learning, or perhaps they invest in new furnishings or fit outs or for the learning spaces in their schools. 
one system leader told me there's no shortage of feds and grifters offering a silver bullet. Principals and system leaders often feel the weight of making those decisions. And I think they reflect too on the opportunity cost implied by any decision they take. The result then across all of the levels of our education system is uncertainty. Is this what will work to improve learning? Is it better to choose the other thing I might have chosen? Will this have the intended impact? Will this represent value for money? Next slide, please. Evidence is what helps us to become more certain about our decisions. Evidence is what teachers and policymakers can draw upon and apply to their specific context so they can feel more confident that they're making the best decisions for their students. Now, figuring out whether the existing evidence base is helpful for teachers and policymakers is a big responsibility to put onto them. It's a task that requires technical knowledge to assess how evidence is produced, how relevant it might be. Systematically reviewing the rigor and relevance of an evidence base also takes a lot of time. So the idea behind a National Evidence Institute is that we can help. We can help busy educators. We can help to give them the information that will help them become more confident decision makers. Next slide. Final point that I wanna make is that figuring out what to do with evidence and how to learn from it and how to turn insights into action is not an easy task. There's a growing emphasis in, on the use of research evidence in education, but the discussions have really focused on the quality of the evidence rather than the quality of the use. And the work that Mark's leading through the Q project reminds us that the evidence changes nothing unless teachers use it and change what they're doing. Even then, use of evidence will have a limited effect unless teachers adopt and adapt the evidence effectively. So I applaud the effort of Mark's team to define and elaborate what quality use of research evidence means in education. And I really like the conceptual framework that reminds us that efforts not just about the practice of teachers, but it requires effort at the system level as well. And that has implications for all of us who are involved in the machinery of education as school and system leaders or teacher educators or policy makers, researchers, research brokers, others. Um, uh, next slide, please. So to close, what will an evidence-informed future look like? Come with me while I dream. In this future, there'll be easy access to robust evidence that is appropriate for the educational issue, for the context, for the intended use, and for the intended user. Teachers will be equipped to effectively implement evidence-informed practices. They'll be accustomed to evaluating their own current practices, their own dispositions, their knowledge, their confidence, and then to accessing tools to assess, assist their development, including support for collaborative effort, school-based professional learning, and so on. In this future, Teachers will not only be confident consumers and implementers, they'll also be effective evidence generators and critical evaluators. Teachers and school leaders and system leaders will be the, the critical consumers of research that Steve Dinham has described in their selection of approaches, of experts, of programs. They won't need us to tell them who are the grifters and what are the fads. They'll assess and evaluate efficiently and effectively. At an organisational level, there'll be coherence between the evidence and the plans and resources that are developed and implemented by systems and schools. There'll be what the framework describes as thoughtful engagement with evidence and careful consideration given to the effective implementation. Teachers will do their work with the confidence of knowing they're doing the right things in the right ways, without the burden of too much choice and uncertainty they'll feel more confident about their own effectiveness and more willing, therefore, to explore opportunities for further refinement of their professional practice. And lastly, there'll be a culture whereby teachers are not exhausted by change or burdened by choice. Rather, they're actively seeking evidence-informed innovations to their practice in their quest for continuous improvement. 
This culture will be enabled by virtue of the time and opportunity that will be made available to teachers to undertake their thoughtful engagement with evidence. Also, we'll have a vaccine for the coronavirus. Climate change will be a thing of the past and my daughter will have finished her HSC and we won't all have cracked up in the effort. Back to you, Lucas. Oh, that's fantastic, Jenny. Thanks so much. Uh, what a, what a, a rich and, and compelling start to this. Uh, one thing that struck me about Jenny's presentation is that, is that we're often thinking about how evidence can be used towards solving some of those grand challenges of which she name checked at the end, but also the challenges we face every day within a school. But there are, there are other dimensions around this, such as its ability to build confidence, to become more confident in what you do and in confident in, in the decisions that you make. And we too in the Q project have been finding this in our interviews with teachers, where we have participants, for example, who are converted. They have been hesitant in the use of evidence, unsure of where to look exactly as you pointed out at the start, and then have realized that not only can it lead to more effective teaching and learning, but that it can in fact build confidence. So thank you very, very much, Jenny, that was terrific. Jenny's also presented a present to us, which is the type of work that Mark Rickinson has been doing with the team on the Q project. And without further delay, I'll hand over to Mark to talk a little bit more about that thoughtful aspect. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much, Lucas. Um, and thanks to Jenny and uh, greetings to everyone joining us online from the many different uh, locations. Um, Jenny's made very clear to us that um, the idea of evidence-informed practice is, is really very much firmly part of the language and the landscape of education. Um, and that's true here in Australia and internationally. She's also made very clear that turning insight into action is no easy task. And that's really the jumping off point for what I want to talk about is this idea of what does it mean to use research evidence well in the context of education? Um, so let's, uh, let's move to the next slide. And I'll just start, it's the, if you're joining us on Australian time, it's, uh, it's kind of dinner time, uh, end, of the, uh, end of the day, and lots of people are turning to, uh, to cooking. And so it's a helpful analogy um, to draw this distinction that Jenny introduced between quality of evidence and quality of use. Now, a lot of the focus in, in education has been on improving the quality of the evidence, which of course is critical and important, but not if, we, if we're neglecting to focus on the other side of the coin, the quality of the use. So if we, in, in using the cooking analogy, we're basically focusing a lot on the ingredients and very little on the ways in which they're used to make beautiful food. Um, and what we're saying uh, from the perspective of the Q project and the ideas that uh, are being presented through uh, this webinar is that we really need to focus on the quality of use as much as and as well as the quality of evidence. So if we go to the next slide, that's really informing the Q project that, that Lucas has already mentioned. The Q project is a five year partnership between Monash University and the Paul Ramsey Foundation, and it's focused on understanding and improving the use of research evidence in Australian schools. Um, and our focus on this is, is kind of from four perspectives and they're all responding to really important gaps, both in the, in the practice around evidence use, but also in, in policy as well. Um, the first thing is when you, you know, surprisingly, um, if a school leader or a teacher came to, came to us and said, um, how do we get better at using research evidence and how do, we, what, you know, how do we know where we're at? There is no framework that we could take from the literature to, to put in the, in the hands of a school leader or a teacher. So we're starting off in strand one by really trying to understand how do we conceptualize it? And what we're doing is we're looking at other sectors, the literature in other sectors in health, social care, in policy, and also of course in education to say, what, what can we draw from education and other sectors uh, it, to help us understand what it means to use research well. We're also, of course, working with schools and Strand 2 is about working with 100 schools across four states to really understand what does it look like in practice in different kinds of primary specials and, and, spe and secondary schools. And drawing on both of those, we're then working 
um, to say, well, how can we not just understand this, but how can we improve it by uh, co-designing co and trialing professional learning? And Jenny's made clear that it's really important to think about system level as well as school level. And so with strand four is about how can we embed this within systems? So let me move to the next slide and kind of drawing on our work in, in strand one and strand two. Um, this is our current framing uh, definition, if you like, of what it means to use research evidence well. And it really emphasizes the thoughtfulness of the engagement and the implementation with the evidence and the appropriateness of the evidence that's being used. So there are two things there that are really central. Of course, as well, none of this happens in a vacuum. And so on the text on the bottom of the slide, you've got this idea of there needs to be support from different kinds of individual and organizational enabling components. Now I'm well aware and the whole Q team are well aware that, that what's on this slide does not trip off the tongue. It's not an easy, uh, an easy thing to pass on. So let me try a couple of different ways to make it kind of to bring it to life for you. If we go to the next slide, here's a diagrammatic version of quality use of research evidence. So if you want more information about this, I'm hoping um, that there'll be a link being shared within uh, the YouTube chat um, function, but you can also just search RE framework and it should come. Um, so you can see that these two ideas of appropriate research evidence and thoughtful engagement and implementation are right there at the core in, in red um, of quality use. And surrounding that in blue are the individual organization, sorry, the individual enabling components of mindset, skill sets, and relationships. And then surrounding that um, in orange are the organizational enabling components. And to try to bring this to life, what I'm going to do is read to you um, four different um, four uh, school leaders who've um, kind of shared, responded to our survey um, and shared a perspective, their understanding on what using research evidence well means. So the first one comes from a special school um, principal in Queensland who said using research evidence well means considering the context of the research and working out the extent to which the research applies to our local context and students. So that's quote A. Quote B comes from an, an, an AP, an assistant principal in a New South Wales primary school, who said using research evidence well for us means to keep an open mind and not be biased, to not jump so quickly to agreeing or disagreeing with evidence. And as I'm reading these, just think about which, which parts of the framework of the diagram might these be relating to. Quote C then comes from a head of primary in a P-12 college in Queensland who said, for us, using research evidence well means that research evidence is examined in a collaborative, loop, a collaborative way so that it's not just one person's interpretation of the evidence. And then finally, um, from a middle school leader in a Victorian uh, high school. Um, quote D is that all teachers involved in implementing a program or practice that purports to be informed by research evidence would have allocated professional learning time to, to read, review and critically analyze that evidence. So what I'll do now, if you just talk through the different components of the framework using those quotes. So if we go to the next slide, we're focusing here in quote A that came from the special school principal um, in, in Queensland, really focused on this idea of appropriateness. For her, it was really important that the recent, that, that, um, that educators were thinking seriously about, does it apply to our context? So that need for appropriateness. But of course, in order to be able to know what is and isn't appropriate, you need to engage with it thoughtfully. And so there's, you can see that those two components are really intricately interconnected. If we go to the next, the next slide, we move on to the individual enabling components where, where quotes B and C spoke very powerfully to that. Remember, there's the quote that was saying to using evidence well is about not jumping too quickly to agree or disagree, to not, you know, to, to avoid being bringing a particular, uh, to, to keep an open mind, speaks very much to mindsets. And then the other quote there, quote C, 
was about, you know, it needs to be done in a collaborative, collaborative way. So it's not just one, one person's perspective. So that really helps to flag up that it's not just skill sets. Of course, skills and knowledge are important, but so too are mindsets. To what extent are we actually open to the evidence? And to what extent are we able to work with other colleagues to make sense of it and to work out what it means in our context? And then moving on to the next slide, we move to the organizational enabling components. And here it's all about context matters, leadership, culture, infrastructure. And that fourth quote, the quote D, really spoke to this where the middle school leader was saying, well, using, you know, having research-based practices is fine, but actually all the teachers need allocated professional learning time in order to be able to engage with that evidence as opposed to just take it at face value. And so that speaks to leadership, culture, and definitely to infrastructure in terms of resources and processes. So what, we, what we're doing here with this framework is trying to unpick and unpack the different components. Well, it's trying to, to define what, quali what it means to use research evidence well, and then to unpick and unpack the components that are involved in, uh, in that and that can help that to happen. And of course, system level influences as, as Jenny's input um, you know, highlighted earlier are critical as well. So let's go to the final, the next slide, which and the final slide. Um, you will hear in a moment um, from Nigel Holloway and Shani Prendergast, and they'll be the ones who will really tell you whether this matters and, and if so, why. Um, but here's a perspective from uh, the, the Q team in terms of our, our understanding of why quality use matters to debates about the, the use of evidence in education. Firstly, if we think about quality use as, a, as an idea and quality use as a framework, it has the potential to move the discussion from one of whether we use evidence to, to a richer discussion about how well we use evidence. Because, you know, when we, when we think about the, the recent experiences, uh, uh, you know, our different experiences of COVID, we don't want leaders who just use evidence. We want leaders who use evidence judiciously, discerningly, wisely, and weigh up livelihoods and life, you know, impact on life, impact on livelihoods, physical health and mental health, et cetera, et cetera. We really do need to be not just saying, yes, we're research-based and ticking it off, but thinking about how well we use evidence. Um, the other two things in the middle there are really important, um, is that by thinking, of, by framing evidence use in relation to quality, it starts to highlight the highly professional skilled task that, that using research evidence is. So it, it picks up that point that Jenny said, turning insights into action is demanding. It is, and it's highly professional. And it helps to connect thoughtful, and, uh, thoughtful use of appropriate evidence into what it means to be an education professional as a, as a school leader, as a teacher, um, and many other roles within, within and beyond schools. The other thing that quality use does is it really highlights that ev evidence doesn't speak for itself. Um, and so that's the, that's actually, sorry, that's the point about professionalism. Evidence doesn't speak to, to itself. It needs to be used by skilled, a skilled professional. The second, the, the, the sort of third point about connecting evidence use to educational improvement is that, um, you know, it's too easy for evidence use to be seen uh, as an end in itself. But it's actually a means to an end. And the end, of course, is, improve, is deepening and enhancing student learning. Um, and the, by approaching it from a quality use side, we, we're sort of encouraged to think more about how can using evidence well link up to powerful impro improvement processes at the school level and at the system level. And finally, we think that this framework and this idea of quality use has potential to help um, individual educators, teams of educators, uh, school leaders, and also system leaders to think seriously about where the capacity is. What are their current strengths? What are areas for improvement in terms of their use of evidence? So thinking about the mindsets, the skill sets, the relationships, thinking about the leadership, the culture, um, and, and the infrastructure that can uh, that either impede or support this idea of using thoughtful, using evidence thoughtfully and using appropriate evidence. Um, 
but of course, as I said, you'll get the real, uh, the, the real judge and information of this will be yourself and the insights, the real insights will come um, from Nigel and Shani in a moment. So back to you, Lucas. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, really, really good coverage there. You know, there, there is a lot in that framework. And, you know, one of the key points that, that uh, resonated again with me with what Mark said was that insofar as Jenny talked about the value of evidence use in building confidence, Mark was also referring to a kind of a disposition to not jump to conclusions that teachers need to be to keep an open mind and that this requires support. In developing the framework, I don't think Mark will mind me saying that thinking about what constitutes quality evidence use is hard. That's what we've in our team have been working through. And now, as Mark had suggest, suggests, we're going to get a bit of an insight from Nigel Holloway, who, as I mentioned before, is the principal of Hamlin Banks Primary School. And Nigel is a really good example of the kind of professional who is the motivation for why we do what we do. So I hand over to you, Nigel. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lucas. Um, and thanks, Mark, for the um, overview of the framework that's being developed by the Q Project team. I think for me, what stood out from what you said is, is the notion of um, the complexity of the work of taking um, the huge amount of research evidence that's available identifying what's actually appropriate and then looking at how do we use that thoughtfully in our school. So I want to start, um, next slide please, I want to start by making two points. Uh, one is that I think we're building from a strong base. So I think there are lots of amazing people in schools doing some great work around using evidence to inform their practice and to inform their decision making. And I think the fact that the Q project is already actively engaging with teachers and school leaders um, is a real uh, wonderful endorsement of the team, I guess, that they're looking to the field to see what's already happening in schools. Um, for me, I'm part of the government education system in Victoria and, and, and proud to be so. I think what's happening in Victoria with the education state agenda is a, a really strong system modelling of highly effective use of research evidence to inform practice. So the work that's come out of the department um, recently around the Victorian teaching and learning model, the high impact teaching strategies have definitely been grounded in research evidence um, and, and, and really great modeling for schools around using, using evidence well. Um, I think what this framework will do for schools and school leaders is provide that guidance and that support to be more explicit, uh, possibly more thoughtful, um, and definitely more intentional about how we use research evidence to guide our work. Thanks. Next slide, Phoebe. Um, I've been asked to talk about the implications of having such a model available to us, because as Mark said, um, a model hasn't been available to us. So I've got four implications I'm going to work through quite quickly. The first implication, I think, is that um, this framework provides a really sound grounding for some honest um, and critical reflection for schools and school leaders around current practices. Um, I think what it also does is it highlights the fact that this is not a yes, we do use research evidence or no, we don't use research evidence kind of situation. This is a um, how do we go about making incremental and ongoing improvements to the way we use research evidence um, in an impactful way that actually makes a difference for teachers and for kids. Um, thanks, Phoebe. Next slide. The second implication that I've got there for schools is around a shift in thinking. Um, and this shift in thinking is, is, has been alluded to already, but it's around moving from seeing evidence or research evidence as the answer or the solution to um, the basis for really rich dialogue and thoughtful deliberation around a very clear problem that's trying to be solved. So um, I think the model provides a really nice way of saying we can go slower here um, and we can actually get really clear about what it is we're trying to achieve um, and then that helps us to use the evidence more appropriately and more thoughtfully. Um, an example from my school here is that when we were starting to think about moving online because of COVID we had to go to online learning um, that started a huge and huge number of ideas being shared you know we could do this we could do that lots of ideas 
being thrown up in the air. What happened is um, when we went back to what's the challenge we're actually trying to uh, accomplish here or, or overcome here, which is how do we help kids to become more literate and more numerate online, um, entirely online, we snapped back very quickly to what, is a, what do we know from the research evidence about highly effective literacy and numeracy teaching. Um, so, so that really was a, a nice example of us using the research evidence to guide our practice. Next slide, Phoebe. The third implication is that thoughtful um, and ongoing engagement with research evidence absolutely can't be the responsibility of one person. I know I've certainly felt the burden of um, having to be the person that um, engages with evidence in an ongoing well, but I think we're well and truly past that, as Jenny alluded to. Meaning making from research evidence is absolutely a team sport. Many minds, lots of thinking and, and careful deliberation. Um, another example from my school in this space is around we switched when uh, COVID hit um, our area and we had to go online with our teaching and learning. We switched from two one hour long meetings after school to a morning briefing every morning for our team. And we did that really intentionally because we knew that um, across the days and weeks, we would need our whole team together on a very regular basis to deliberate around the emerging evidence. Um, so be that evidence from our teams about how things are going on the ground with kids. Um, and then what happened was uh, the rapid evidence review came out, um, which had a range of findings that we could then deliberate with and talk around with our team to guide the decisions we were making about how we would run our school online. Thanks, Phoebe. Next slide. The last implication that I want to talk to is, I guess, um, that this framework provides a compelling and possibly confronting truth that it's actually no longer okay to ignore the research evidence or to use it ineffectually. In my mind, I've been thinking about this a lot, in my mind, this model assumes a willingness to engage with evidence. Um, and I think there's some work to be done there across different sectors um, in our profession around that, that baseline assumption that um, as professional educators, um, and working with young people that it's, it is an assumption that we are willing to work with research evidence, to engage with that evidence and to use it thoughtfully to inform our practice. Last slide, please, Phoebe. Thank you. Um, a final thought from me, I guess, and it's really coming back to the middle of the model that um, Mark shared and talked to earlier, is that I think if we can get appropriate and thoughtful right, so for me as a principal and school leader, if I can get um, the right evidence based on the, the problem that we've identified really clearly. And I can um, really consider how to use that evidence thoughtfully with my team um, to shift our thinking forward or to expand our thinking, um, then that's really going to make all of the rest of the model more helpful. So working on mindset and um, those other areas of the model are going to be more helpful if we really nail appropriate and thoughtful use of research evidence. Um, I'll just leave you with one final example. Given that we're all have living with um, COVID at the moment and, and have moved through an experience, I think what's happened in, in my school, for example, is that our operations, our school operations have been 100% guided by research evidence, by what the health experts are saying is um, essential and necessary. Uh, the evidence has been trusted. It's been implemented with rigour. Um, and, and real intention. Our teachers have been open to feedback and critical reflection and thinking about how what we've put into place is working. Um, and not only has that been expected, that feedback and that critical thought, it's been embraced and encouraged. Um, and individuals in our team, every individual in our team, has been absolutely active and thoughtful um, in their contributions to rolling out a plan for our kids, which has been brilliant. The problem that we were trying to solve was really clear. The evidence was incredibly relevant. Um, and, I, and I'm gonna leave everyone with this final thought. I can't help but wonder and get excited about the prospect um, if all appropriate research evidence was used in schools with, with that level of rigor and that level of intention, uh, what could happen? It'd be kind of exciting. And it kind of leads me to thinking about Jenny's utopian future. So I'm gonna leave it there and throw back to you, Lucas. Thank you. Great stuff, Nigel. Uh, you know, there, there's, again, 
a lot in there. Uh, one of the things that, that really struck me about what you were talking about was towards the end. I'm um, thinking about the variability of how the uh, effects of COVID-19 have been experienced throughout the world in different countries. Mm -hmm. And to your point that it's not okay to ignore the research. And I think as a person who lives in a city that's currently in lockdown, I kind of have to keep reminding myself of that every day. The other th really important thing that I thought Nigel raised with us, it's not a question of are we using evidence, but are we using evidence to good effect? I thought you made that really clear. Evidence uses a thinking thought process that involves discussion. It doesn't occur in isolation. It involves teams of people. So thanks very much, Nigel. That was wonderful. And last but not least, uh, I'm going to hand over to Shani, who is uh, a deep thinker, passionate advocate, who's going to look at this from a jurisdictional perspective. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Shani. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, everyone. Massive high five to you, Nigel, and all the other teachers and leaders that we have um, with us this evening. What a big time it's been for you, your leadership um, and your dedication to keep kids learning has been truly inspirational. So high five and big hugs to all my fellow Melburnians and Victorians who are still in lockdown. And if you're a teacher and a leader and also in Melbourne and Victoria, you deserve more than high fives and hugs. I think you deserve presents. So people, if you know teachers and leaders in Victoria, send us presents, please. <laughs> um, such a good conversation to be part of around quality evidence use in schools. This time of COVID-19, as you've heard from the other speakers, has really highlighted how important research and evidence is. You know, for example, we're all invested in the research that's going into finding a vaccine. You know, we've got leaders and epidemiologists looking at research and evidence from past pandemics and how we deal with it now in this COVID-19. We're looking at evidence in the impact of current interventions such as mask wearing and our, our lockdowns, et cetera. But also in education, I think there has also been a greater focus on research and evidence. So we know from the literature and also from working with schools that teachers and leaders tend to prefer, prefer the knowledge, their own knowledge from their past experience or experience of their colleagues over, um, the, over research evidence. But in this time of a pandemic, we actually don't have experience in a pandemic to draw on. So we found pretty early on when those decisions had to be made quickly when schools were closed, that more teachers and leaders were asking us, what is the evidence on remote learning? How are we gonna make these decisions and to implement these ways of working for our kids to really extend their learning? So we found that more people were actually asking for research and evidence. So what an opportune time to keep that conversation going and really think about how can we use evidence better in education? So I've, I've just got two questions that I'd like to answer in my brief time. So just the first slide there, please. Um, I, I really just want to say, firstly, what does the quality use of research evidence mean for jurisdictions, such as Catholic Education Melbourne, but also what are the implications for jurisdictions? So the first one there, in terms of what does it mean, it has meaning at two levels. So the first one may seem obvious internally, how do we as a system better use research evidence in our decisions, in our policy development, in our resource development, et cetera. But more important or increasingly important is actually the school facing element of what we do. So not only how do we as a system, as system staff, use research evidence better, but how do we help our schools to use research evidence better? And in fact, by us internally using research evidence and thinking really thoughtfully and deliberately around that, we are modelling to schools um, the quality use of research evidence. So, for example, the work we have been doing at CEM in the last couple of years in particular that's been explicit on, on evidence use We've actually been using the research on evidence use to help schools with their evidence use. So there's an example where we've been modelling actually using evidence in practice. But I do want to say that this is, it, it's, we're on a journey and that um, there's no stopping point. So we, we're trying to continuously improve what we do and there are some challenges. So internally, we are a large organisation and like, you know, even in schools and other large organisations, to build the confidence and the capability of a large workforce to engage with research evidence and embed that in all decisions, that, that's a challenge. 
But one of the biggest challenges for us and all jurisdictions actually in Australia for the school facing work is that there are very little jurisdiction wide or system wide examples of strategies, initiatives, projects to help schools explicitly engage with research evidence. There's certainly not many of them published. So there's not a lot of examples for us to draw on. There's certainly great pockets of practice, but not system-wide, jurisdiction-wide examples that we're able to learn from or use as a guide. Next slide, Next slide please. So what are, what are the implications then of quality evidence use? I think the biggest implication and what I've noticed over the last couple of years in our jurisdiction and probably even more broadly, is that there's been this gradual movement from evidence use being implicit to much more explicit, or at least the, the desire or awareness to make it more explicit. So we've often named, you've heard terms like research engaged schools or evidence informed practice. We've named those things in, you know, in teaching standards, in school improvement frameworks, in um, research documents, et cetera. But we've now really started to move to an explicit focus on, we can't just name it and expect schools know how to do it well, what are we actually doing to build the confidence and capability to use evidence well in schools? So I'll just give a couple of examples where we've moved from implicit to explicit. For starters, with our school improvement framework. So we've often we've named evidence use and research engagement for a while, but in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, our school improvement framework has five spheres. And we've, we've now developed a, an accompanying rubric, which actually unpacks those spheres and has capabilities under them. And in those capabilities, we've now explicitly named evidence use under four of them. So really, really important. We're not just saying that it's important and implying now that it's part of our rubric, schools are being reviewed against that and also have a chance to now set a deliberate goals around evidence use. The other really good example where we are explicitly focusing on research engagement and evidence use in schools currently is a pilot that we have called the Research Leads Pilot. So we heard from some of our schools in a project we did three years ago now uh, around their engagement with evidence. They said one of the barriers is that there's no one in their school to help them do that. So we explored this idea of a research lead which came out of the UK and so we, um, through a grant process, we've, we've funded a small cohort of schools to have a dedicated research leader. That doesn't mean that that research leader is responsible for all the evidence use in the school, but they have been given time and the opportunity and professional learning to actually implement strategies to help their school be more evidence informed, to create a culture around evidence use. And that looks differently in those different schools, but an example where we've moved to a much more explicit approach. I know there's been lots of comments already on the quality use of research evidence frameworks. I won't go through all of those dot points there, but what's so critical about this work and what's so important mark flag that we haven't up until now actually had an Australian framework or something that conceptualizes quality evidence use. And that framework really has taken quite a complex body of literature. It's easy when people understand the words quality evidence use to think the, to think that we know what that means, but it's not until you immerse yourself in the literature where you realise this is very complex and actually has a number of interdependent factors. So what the framework does is it highlights how complex, it actually simplifies a complex body of literature and the different components that matter a lot when we're talking about quality evidence use. And then also highlights the need to be explicit. We, I think for a while, particularly in Australia and probably internationally too, we've tended to focus on if we just make research evidence available to individual teachers, if we get it in their hands and they should be able to go ahead and use it in their classrooms. But we realise it's much more complex than that. There's a lot of evidence around eating well and exercising, a lot of evidence to say that's a good idea, but doesn't necessarily mean we do it. So there's all of these other things that need to be thought of, such as the individual teacher mindsets and skill sets. What are the school cultures that we're creating? So having those multifaceted elements made very clear in the framework makes us think as a system, we can't just focus on making evidence available, although that's a good start. What are we doing at those other levels to really um, build the capability for schools, teachers and leaders to use evidence better? The last dot point there is also something that I think has been really important for, for systems and jurisdictions. 
I'm part of a research and education network, which we call the REN, made up of senior leaders who look after research in their jurisdictions. And the conversation, we, we talk about research that's conducted in schools and our policies and process around that. But in the last couple of years, we really have moved towards research engagement and evidence use. And this framework, and until now, it's been quite a nebulous sort of concept that people have slightly different ideas around it. But what this framework has done, it gives us a common understanding and a clear understanding of those key things that are critical for evidence use for us to think about in our individual jurisdictions, but also in our conversations and our initiatives across jurisdictions. So such a fantastic piece of work. And I genuinely believe it's the tipping point in this space, something that we've needed to really help us guide us move forward. So just want to finish on um, my last slide here, a quote that I came across recently, uh, a book that was that came out of the UK this year called The Research Informed Teaching Revolution by uh, Brown, Flood and Hanscom. But this particular quote is from um, the, the chapter that was by Raphael Wilkins. He says, it is essential that evidence informed practice becomes the norm across the teaching work of a school. A teacher not research engaged would be like a driver not looking at road signs, but that does require a rethink about research. And he goes on to explain that research needs to be broadened in its understanding to include professional research and where professional judgment should be a valuable form of evidence. But what I really like about this analogy is that road signs like research evidence by themselves are not enough. It takes the fundamental skills to drive a car, but also the experience to navigate the streets, to anticipate other drivers. But the road signs like research evidence help us to get to that destination efficiently and safely. And there are some road signs that you just can't ignore. As Nigel said, we can't actually ignore research any longer. Well, thanks very much, everyone. That's, um, that's all from me, Lucas, back to you. Thanks so much, Shani. Giving shape to the things that we're, we're, we're talking about today in, in a very, very clear way. I'm going to, uh, I've, I've actually got a, a follow up question for you, Shani, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite all of our speakers uh, back, Jenny, Mark and Nigel. And for those out there in the internet, if you've got any questions, uh, then please start putting them through because we've got a bit of time now to stretch our legs, have a conversation. And while you're doing that, I will pose a question to Shani first, which was, you talked about the research leads pilot. Uh, and, you know, there's this, there's this idea that there's, there's someone driving it. But Nigel made the point as well that, it, you know, evidence use doesn't occur within a vacuum, that it's a very, it's a very social cultural activity involving groups of people. From that pilot, do you have any insights about what the key touch points are to leverage change of evidence use within a school? Yeah, great question. Um, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, we were a little bit, when we embarked on this pilot, we certainly were had that in our minds. Is it okay to have one person that drives this? But we did reach out to some colleagues in the UK and explored the literature around this. And because we are in such early days, particularly here in Australia and in our system, actually starting with some of those people who are really research engaged and enthusiastic already, we thought was a great place to start. So having these people and part of the grant process, we knew that we had to get leadership on board and that leaders, their principals had to be very supportive of this. So we realised that the research leads that are gonna do the best job are the ones that have absolutely had their leadership team and their principal articulate that this is important for our school. Evidence use and research engagement is a priority and we're setting time aside. So having that leadership support is critical. And also we, we really tried to think about with these research leads and based on their feedback, encourage them just to start small. They don't have to change the whole school all at once but starting with a particular school improvement priority or starting with a particular group of teachers or professional learning team as a place to really think about how they can use research evidence. So principal guidance and support, making that formal in their school improvement plans, making it a key priority, but also starting small, starting with a key group of teachers, focusing on one school improvement priority as a starting point. 
So there are sort of emerging insights so far, but early days. Early days. Thanks, Shani. That's great. And turning to, to Jenny now, you know, how do we link how we as a system use research better uh, in relation to that school facing aspect that Shani talked about? Hi, that's another really good question. Um, I, I have my own thoughts about that, but uh, over the course of the last few weeks since I came into the role, I've been doing really wide consultation with people about what they're hoping a National Evidence Institute will do, what priorities they think we ought to pursue, how they want to see us operate, etc. And uh, it's encouraging to, to hear a lot of unanimity of view from ministers and secretaries and director generals and uh, school leaders and teachers about the things they think are priorities, um, but also kind of encouraging to know that they're recognising similar sorts of issues and challenges. So um, I get from system leaders the understanding that, you know, there's an evidence base there. We kind of we kind of buy it. We think that the evidence in is in on what is effective practice. What we're not so certain about is is that the practice that's happening in classrooms and how can we be sure and what do we need to do at a system level to try and support that to be the practice in classrooms? And as I was talking about in most of my presentation, we also hear from teachers to say, well, of course, I want to be evidence informed. I want to put the right things into practice, but there's an awful lot of stuff out there. How do I know what is the right thing? So I guess the story that I'm hearing is, Everybody has the right intention. There's a lot of goodwill. I think I want to note something that Shani said that nothing will happen unless we actively carve out the time to make it happen. It is going to be the task of school leaders and potentially systems, organisation level people to make available time for all of the players in this equation to be able to come to grips with not only what is the evidence, what is the best, most effective practice, but how are we going to put that into practice in the most effective way? Lucas, I'm not sure if I veered totally away from your question then. I kind of got on a roll and wanted to keep telling you. <laughs> no, no, you rolled with it, Jenny. That was great. Uh, and, and it really is an important point that it's a, it's, a, it's a conscious, deliberate thing that we need to work together to carve out time to think about and act upon these things. Turning to Nigel now, you know, Nigel, can you give a practical example of a challenge informed by better evidence use or, you know, kind of related to that was, you know, when COVID-19 happened and you were going through all those possible ideas, to use that cliched word now, pivoting, uh, when you were doing that, um, can, you, can you give an example of how you decided which steps to take and evidence use in relation to that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's probably a couple of different ways I could go. But um, before I do, I just wanted to say, um, just off the back of what Jenny had commented around providing that time, I think that that's a really, I, I want to kind of just back that point around as a school leader in a school, um, for me, a lot of thinking has happened around how do I make this just the work, not a special extra thing you do when you get home and you've got the time, that it's part of the job embedded daily activity of being an educator is keeping myself up to date and informed with what's happening in the world of research. And, and part of that is a filtering process. So as a school leader, how do I filter and access that research evidence that is um, really relevant? Because that's the part, Lucas, to speak to your question. That's the part that was made my job actually particularly easy in this time in some ways is that the, the evidence that I needed to access was super clear. Um, the challenge was super clear. There was no ambiguity about what the problem was. Um, so one example I guess I can give is we had to move almost 400 five to 12 year olds <laughs> into their bedrooms and their lounge rooms and all of their teachers into their lounge rooms get them all connected technologically somehow with a range of families with no technology, with some technology, um, with a range of beliefs around technology and screen time, with a whole range of cultural beliefs around being online and connecting with educators in that way, um, about whose job it is to be the teacher, um, a whole range of stuff, thinking about people's well-being, et cetera, et cetera. 
one way we used research evidence was when the Education and Endowment um, Foundation published their, their quick or rapid um, education review of what works for remote learning, we as a staff used those key findings to really, um, I guess, filter our thinking about how we would behave. So um, yes, we had lots of great options about these whiz bang things we could do while we were online, but actually what the review said was um, that the quality of teaching is far more important than how lessons are delivered. So let's not worry about the bells and whistles, let's get right back to what the literature says constitutes good quality literacy education and literacy instruction. What are those high yield strategies? And then how do we bring those to life in an online um, kind of forum? So I'm not sure, again, if that's hit the mark, but that's kind of how we attended to the relevant research in the moment. I love that point that you're making, Nigel, about the evidence the evidence used providing clarity, you know, mm -hmm. where, where, and the other point that you made there that I thought was very salient was, you know, we need to, we need to normal, we need to make exceptional practice, normal practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's a big task for all of us. Uh, Mark, did you have any comments at this point that you wanted to, to make in relation to what we've spoken about thus far? No, I mean, I think it's just very interesting to hear, you know, different examples from a si at the system level, the school level, um, of the ways in which, you know, research evidence can be clarifying, um, you know, but also, also the opposite. Um, I, I guess one, one thing I was going to pick up on is the, the, the sort of point that Shani made in her, in her final slide about how, you know, kind of seeing the road signs is is not enough you need to, you know you need to be you know a, a very skilled driver as well um and uh i think that's a really important one i think all of our discussions about um the use of research evidence needs also to to hold on to the the limitations um of of evidence as well as its potential um and the idea that um you know it's a it's i don't know it's kind of like it's it's, it's part of um, being a, a, a fantastic educator, but it's not, it's, it, it, it's, it's not the only thing by any means, you know, it's, it's a kind of an enhancer or something. And I think thinking about that um, is a really important one. It's the same thing that, you know, using evidence is, is not the end, it, it's a means to an end. And it's, it's part of the picture, it's part of improvement and, and actually kind of recognizing its limitations actually opens up its potential in a way. Mm, well said. I noticed furtive nodding there, Jenny. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add in, in response to what Mark said? Uh, look, I, I completely agree. I think that um, there is, I, I referenced it, you know, what is it that people use when they need to make a decision? It's their experience, it's their skill, it's their training, it's their knowledge. Um, what, what we're interested in is assuming that all of the people involved in education are, are there because they want to do the best thing possible for students and they're all interested in being even better at what they do and having evidence about what might enhance your practice we're assuming is going to be of interest to people. I guess the challenge for the National Evidence Institute is going to be how to make that available to people in ways that um, is easy for them to access, that uh, is in, in the, the kind of modes that they want to be able to consume information, um, offers opportunities to not just be consumers, but to actually be partners in the generation of, ev of evidence and feed back into an evidence um, creation cycle, if you like. There's so many opportunities here, none of which are intended to say, everybody's got it all wrong and we've got the way of doing it right and you've all got to do it this way from now or forever after. It, it's about taking everybody along on a, 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 an exercise in trying to be better than we have been. Very big challenge, but a totally worthwhile one. Okay, so I'm going to throw now open to any questions from our viewers. Uh, Chantelle and Grace, have we got anything... Yeah, we've got tons of questions coming in at this point. Lots and lots and lots of questions, a lot of engagement in the chats. So my first question here is from Maria. 
And this one might be a good one for Mark and Shani to start with. But how can leaders support thoughtful engagement with research by teachers? For example, guiding questions, thinking routines, etc. Thank you, Maria. Um, Shani, perhaps we'll start with you. Sure. In the, um, the work we did, it's called the User Project, Understanding School Engagement in Research. We had so many comments about leaders and the critical nature of leaders, so I appreciate the question. And something that really stood out is teachers, even if they didn't have an innate interest necessarily in research evidence, when they saw that their leader was modelling the use of research evidence in their decision-making in staff meetings, but also when staff would come to them with an idea, for example, a leader would always ask, you know, what's the research evidence to support that? Let's explore that. So that practicing what you preach, I suppose, was a really strong theme that came from staff in schools, even the ones that weren't necessarily convinced that they had to engage with research evidence. They were very strong about the need for their leader to model the use of research evidence. So I think that that's an important one um, around modelling. Thanks, Shani. Mark? Yeah, I, yeah I was, I'd really echo that, Shani. I was going to say absolutely that kind of the modelling, the thoughtfulness um, and, and kind of fostering a culture within the school and with all forums within the school of, a, of you know, it's fine to ask questions about why we're doing things. There's something really important about having a culture that's open to um, there's almost an expectation uh, of leaders providing explanations um, mm. for, uh, for, for, you know, decisions, for new initiatives, uh, for, for the stopping of initiatives. I think the other thing is that, um, and this is where it's important to, you know, Maria, not just to think about um, evidence use as separate, but saying there are almost certainly there, are, there will be um, very productive um, professional learning communities or um, subject teams or other kind of forums within a school where there are relationships of respect and challenge in the sense that, you know, we know each other well enough, not just to respect each other, but also to be able to challenge our understandings. And so um, trying to link up processes of evidence use with, you know, productive um, kind of forums that are already within the school, I think also is, is an important idea. Thank you, Mark. And thanks for that question, Maria. Grace. Um, Lucas, I've got another question. Um, we've actually got, um, I think you're quite in tune with our YouTube audience because some of the questions that they had, you did actually already answer them. Um, but I've got another one from EI um, and it's a question for Jenny. Jenny, does the government need to develop an education policy that encourages evidence-based decision-making in school? I don't know that that's the best way to get people on board all the time. Going out and saying, everybody, we're doing a new thing. Everybody join in. It's a good thing. It's the right thing and you all have to do it never seems to land all that well with the education community. I think what we've got the op opportunity of doing with the National Evidence Institute is offering a service, offering um, a, a place where people can hopefully go to get information that they desire and are seeking and offer at the same time a work stream that's really focused on supporting the use and the implementation of the evidence that's available. Um, so my, my feeling is the, the, the heavy hand of the government bureaucracy is never the best way to motivate people that, in fact, going the way that we're going, designing something that is for practitioners, uh, that is deeply consulted with practitioners, is probably going to be a more appealing and attractive way of getting things done. Thanks, Jenny. And I can't help but think that given that openness to new ideas has come up a few times tonight that compelling a person to be open ain't going to turn out too well. <laughs> Chantel, Grace, have we got another question? Yeah, so the next question I've got is probably a good one for Lucas and Mark, and it's from Jess. And Jess is asking, I'm interested to hear the panel's thoughts on the role of teacher educators and education researchers in this area. 
Mark, I'll throw to you. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a really important, really important question, Jess. Uh, thank you for asking it. Um, let's take educational researchers first, because uh, in all, all teacher educators are also educational researchers. So there's a, there's an overlap there. Um, you remember in the um, in the quality use of research evidence framework that the Q project has, has put out, um, the outer ring was system level influences. I didn't have time to cover that, but the, the two points that are really important with system level influences is one, you're not gonna be able to have quality use in schools or systems unless you have um, a productive connected evidence ecosystem. What that means is you need, um, the production, you know, the generation of evidence by educational researchers, the um, the synthesis of evidence by um, evidence brokers, the communication of evidence by evidence brokers, and then the use of it by by evidence users like practitioners. Those need to be connected, not not disconnected. So that's a that's about an evidence ecosystem. But the other the other point is that um, you know that the the, the, the um, Influences beyond the evidence ecosystem can be can be very negative and constraining on the evidence ecosystem. So, educational researchers have a really important part to play within this. Um, I'd say two things. One is by thinking really carefully about the idea of research being systematic research made public. So, thinking about how can we make our work more accessible, more understandable, more you know, easier to apply in, in context of practice. And also how can we be curious about the use of research evidence, not just the generation of, of evidence, but also its, its synthesis and, its, and its, its communication and its use. So that's the role of educational researchers. The role of teacher educators is also critical because where, do, where are we going to build the skills and the capacity to use research evidence well, it's within teacher, initial teacher education and then ongoing professional learning. And both of them are really, really important. Thanks so much, Mark. We've got time for a couple more questions. We've got a lot of questions, Lucas. And what, this next one's for Nigel, um, which straight after your presentation, Nigel, the chat just went crazy <laughs> with discussions. I don't that's a good thing or not. Yeah. Um, so we've got one from Selena for you on how do you bridge the gap for skeptical teachers who believe research happens in a world that is different to their everyday reality? Oh, good one. Um, I would say that skeptical teachers are um, sometimes deeply misunderstood. So I have um, I have a real love of the tricky question asker, and I think sometimes people are labelled or maybe um, uh, or branded as the difficult person or the the person who wants to be left alone or the person who's not interested in um, thinking about their practice. I, I would push back a bit on that assumption, and I would say probably. Uh, people are a product of their lived experience. So um, if, if an educator is saying, I'm not that interested in, in listening to this new thing, it's probably because they've had that many new things thrown at them over the course of their career and they've learnt through experience that actually it's probably not going to make a pin of difference to the outcomes for their young people. I think if we can engage those people, what we'll realise is that they're probably um, very wise and, and very insightful and, and very helpful people to have on our side when we're talking about making more thoughtful changes to our practice that might yield actual improvements rather than um, insight change fatigue. Because I think that's, that happens a fair bit in schools is um, we've got a problem and we throw things at it. Uh, so we've got a program and we're going to do this and there's an initiative and all of a sudden, over the course of just 12 months in my professional life, um, as an educator in a classroom with 24 little human beings that I'm trying to work with, I'm asked to do 15 different things rather than asked to do one thing really thoughtfully and really well. So I would caution against um, labelling people as the sceptics. I think what we can do to bridge the gap for those people that are genuinely disinterested in engaging in research evidence is use all of the systems that are already in place. 
Um, there are performance and development processes for that exact reason. Um, it's part of our professional obligation to be engaging thoughtfully with evidence and to be improving as um, you know each year and, and, and along the way. So hopefully that sort of attends to the question a little bit. Thanks so much, Nigel. Uh, let's have we've got time, I think, for perhaps two more questions. Yeah, so the next question I've got is also actually directed to Nigel. So I'll follow on um, from that last one. And it's from Claire. And Claire's asking, what can schools do if parents believe they know better than what the evidence tells us? E.g. they want their child to have a full-time teacher assistant support. Oh, again, I think, so some of, it's really interesting. So these questions, um, I'm glad that I got the, both the curly ones, the juicy ones, that's great. Um, Claire, thanks for your question. I think what the question highlights to me is that you've got parents in your school community that care deeply about the young person. Um, so if you think about those parents, instead of being um, difficult and wanting um, to buck the evidence, think of them as um, people who care deeply about their child and want the very best for them. And I think coming to those conversations with those positive assumptions will assist in getting all of the people on the same page and, and having the same conversation. So rather than it being adversarial, then it can be um, more cooperative. Um, I think in terms of bringing people on board with whatever research evidence you are trying to um, bring to the fore. So, for example, in my community, three years ago, I launched, um, I'm going to describe it as a tirade around the place, and I talked about restorative practices um, and working restoratively um, and thoughtfully around behaviour with anyone that would listen. And, and it was a really big challenge for a lot of people to move their thinking from a punitive system where if you do the wrong thing, you get in trouble, to a restorative system, whereas if you do the wrong thing or you make a mistake, we support you to repair the harm and move on. That took a lot of work with a lot of people. And I think it was about being willing to invest the time and to listen really intently to what that person was saying. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, let's have one more question, please. Hi, Lucas. We've got one question for Shani um, that is from Brian. So the panel has highlighted how teachers discuss and collaborate around research. When teachers are so widely dispersed in Australia, let alone in lockdown because of COVID-19, how can teachers be supported by professional associations, jurisdictions or government stakeholders to socialise or collaborate around research use better? Interesting, that's a great, a really great question and I've got a really practical example. So with this research leads pilot that we're conducting, when schools were forced to go into lockdown, we thought, well, wow, these people can't do their roles. Teachers won't be coming together to explore research. And some schools rightly did say, now's not the time they can't keep going. But actually the most of the, that cohort have reported back that this time has have actually given them an opportunity to collaborate online through Google community, you know, WebEx, what are, whatever online systems schools are using, and actually are having the time to engage with research evidence more than they did pre-lockdown, which is interesting. And the research leads found at this time, they're actually more able to dedicate time and not be interrupted as much to do this role of a research lead. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this time of COVID, I think a couple of our research leads have said there's been a greater appetite for research and evidence because teachers have felt a little bit fearful or out of their depth. So they've been more open to actually visiting to what the research evidence says. So there's something um, unique, the silver lining in this time that some schools have actually found it a bit easier to segment their times and actually dedicate actual time to engage with research evidence and look at those structures that are already set up and how they might include research evidence in those conversations and that collaboration. But we will, we, I would like to actually explore further with our research leads, what are some of those examples? Because that's just some early anecdotal evidence, but that's quite promising to hear. 
Thanks so much, Shani. Uh, Mark, what are the next steps for the Q project? Well, the next steps for the Q project. Um, the most important next step um, is to really move our, our framework from being something which is conceptual and abstract to something which is kind of professional and usable. And that means working much more closely with our partner schools to really um, understand what using evidence well really looks like in different contexts and what's involved to bring it to life. Um, and we're going to be working very closely with uh, our partner schools across four states um, to, to kind of make that happen. Um, the other thing that's really important for the, for the Q project is kind of building the conversation around this. I mean, Nigel, Shani, uh, Jenny's inputs have all flagged up um, you know, the importance of this area and the kinds of questions that we've had from all the different um, people who are online have flagged different aspects of it, but there are many different ways into this. And we want to try and bring people together around conversations around what does quality evidence use mean for educational improvement? What does quality evidence use mean for educational professionalism? And what does evidence use mean for navigating complexity? And so we're launching a discussion paper um, that entitled Towards Quality Use of Evidence in Australian Education that tries to show how the framework helps to raise those really important questions and to hopefully bring more um, educators and system leaders and other, other players within the evidence ecosystem, researchers, teacher educators, research brokers around this issue to really um, work together on what it means to work towards quality, not just quality evidence, but quality use. Thanks so much, Mark. So there are resources there that are available from our website uh, that if you want to dig deeper, then they're available there. But more importantly, discussions like this can take place because people who really care about the quality of teaching and learning carve out the time themselves to come together to talk in a forum like this. And I really want to warmly, warmly thank Jenny, Nigel, Shani and Mark for their excellent presentations and to all of you out there for your contributions and your really, really insightful questions. We, uh, we hope to be able to have more of these in the future. And thanks again to the Paul Ramsey Foundation for their partnership with us in enabling this to happen. Uh, so all of you out there, please send positive vibes to our speakers by way of thanks. <laughs>